Brand new designs are up on the Edge Redbubble, werewolves, spiders, FedEx amphibians, protocrocs, and more. Go check out the Redbubble with links in the description and comment section below. We all know our dinosaurs, right? There are the two-legged horrible carnivorous monsters and then everything else that chows down on plants. That's how the world works, right? There are herbivores, carnivores, and omnivores. Life on Earth has always been governed by the same rules that it is governed by now. By that, I mean there are no rules. The concept of herbivores and carnivores is to help out with organization, but doesn't really reflect the reality of the situation. Both herbivores and carnivores fall on a spectrum of greater or lesser herbivory or carnivory. See, here's that spectrum. On one hand, we have herbivores, the other, carnivores. In the middle are omnivores. The vast majority of life on Earth does not exist on the farthest sides of the spectrum. I hesitate to place any common animals on here because even they do not follow rules as binary as plant versus meat. But we can place animals like koalas and pandas near the herbivore tag and cats at the carnivore tag. Both are capable of digesting small portions of meat or veg if in dire stress, but are almost entirely strict herbivores or carnivores. Deer, tortoises, horses, cows, giraffes, and a bunch of other hoofed mammals have all been observed consuming the flesh of other animals. These assumed herbivores do this for a variety of reasons, but chief among them is that they are lacking something important in their diet. That something is usually a vitamin, like calcium. Just for your horror, let's take a quick run through the various clips of peaceful herbivores chowing down on baby birds or small mammals when the situation presents itself. Okay, that's enough, you get the point. So, with all that, how can we be certain that any extinct animal was really an herbivore? Whatever an herbivore even means. All we have to go off of are their bones, occasional stomach contents, and inference based on similar skeletal characteristics to modern animals. Altogether, those are pretty good criteria, and it's not like any paleontologist is truly just pulling things out of nowhere. But how strong is the idea that dinosaurs traditionally considered herbivores are truly herbivores? Well, you can't be certain. Most, if not all, herbivorous non-avian dinosaurs were probably capable of consuming flesh just like modern herbivores. However, some were better adapted for acquiring that flesh than others. Sauropod dinosaurs, for example, could only get their occasional supplements by surprising small animals in trees and gobbling them down with their pencil teeth rimmed mouths, or stomping things to road pizza with their tree trunk legs. They had teeth specifically adapted for stripping the leaves off branches and swallowing them without chewing. They weren't the best candidate for ripping and crushing flesh. In order for a mostly herbivorous animal to also have the capability for murder and processing of corpses, it's gotta have some special anatomy. These animals need the general herbivore anatomy of teeth suited for browsing and grazing, long teeth tooth rows, and vertically displaced jaw joints. 
Then they need some part of their mouths that is also good at slicing or crushing, like the jagged blade-like molars of bone breakers, pointy canine-shaped teeth at the front, or deep, recurved, sharp beaks. Among the non-avian dinosaurs, the horned dinosaurs, or ceratopsians, fit these criteria best. For the longest time, paleontologists have known that the jaws of ceratopsians were powerful tools used for shearing through the toughest of materials. The part of the jaw that held the teeth were inset into the skull. That means they were not the edge of the jaw, but were forced inwards towards the middle of the skull. This allowed more room for large jaw muscles to power the bite. They would have had some form of cheek tissue, but that wouldn't have been the same as mammals, less like this and more like this. The tooth rows slid past one another like scissor blades. This is unusual in non-avian dinosaurs, but also in herbivorous animals. Most slice up chunks of food with the front of the mouth and then crush it into paste with the back teeth. The hadrosaurs, for example, had huge batteries of leaf-shaped teeth that created a crushing, rather than shearing, surface at the top of the tooth row. When they bit down, their jaws moved sideways and grinded food sideways against the teeth. The teeth of ceratopsians, like triceratops, were three-pronged or leaf-shaped and almost molar-like. Each time I see them while researching this video, I keep comparing them in my mind to the spade drill bit. Please tell me you see the resemblance. The teeth and jaw anatomy of the horned dinosaurs means they weren't crushing things into paste. Instead, they were slicing things into chunks. Some researchers have taken a look at their teeth under the microscope and have found microscopic wear and tear, or scratches, on the teeth. They have also found a spattering of silica in these teeth. All of this is evidence that the teeth were used to process plant material. Then we add in the deep recurved powerful beak of the ceratopsian to the equation and suddenly strict herbivory is looking a little iffy. I'm not the only one. The true nature of the ceratopsian mouth has been questioned by many a researcher for decades, but no one has yet to do a quantitative study on it. The major questioning here is why the jaws were so different than other herbivores. Why would these animals forego crushing things into paste that is easier to digest? After all, most food slicers are carnivores. Meat is easier to slice, chop, and mash, and digest than plants. One of the most accepted explanations has been that these dinosaurs were chowing down on the hardest, most nutritionally deficient plant material around. Bark, palm fronds, branches, and more. It certainly fits with the evidence. They could have used their huge heads and forelimbs to flip over huge plants to get at the roots and chomp through all parts of any given plant. They didn't have to be picky eaters like more narrow-snouted herbivores. An angle I didn't think of when first writing this video that has now become apparent is the presence of ornaments. Ceratopsians are the horned dinosaurs for a reason. When an animal grows such elaborate crests, they need a lot of material to make them. That material could be attained by eating calcium-rich plants that the organism can sniff out. Or it could be just as simple as chewing on rocks or calcium mineral deposits. Lots of modern animals chew on bones as a way to get their calcium, but many also get it straight from the living source. There seems to be an equal amount of video evidence of traditionally herbivorous animals eating small animals. But I have to wonder if it happens more often in animals with antlers, horns, or really big body parts. They need the extra calcium and protein to keep their bodies growing those adornments. That correlates rather well with the teeth and jaws of the ceratopsians. If that line of reasoning holds any water whatsoever, then you might expect a similar pig-like occasional omnivory in other decorated dinosaurs, like stegosaurs and ankylosaurs. Stegosaurs, of course, had a whole suit of plates, spines, and a thagomizer, and ankylosaurs were studded in armor and carried huge sledgehammers on their tails. Both were heavy-set dinosaurs with wide-gauge hips. Stegosaurs seemed the more heavily herbivorous of the two, since they had thin pointy snouts capped in a tweezer beak with small leaf-shaped teeth, not great for chewing up small animals. 
Ankylosaurs, on the other hand, were much wider and shorter, with wider snouts and huge noses that gave them a tremendous sense of smell. Though their teeth aren't especially suited to occasional omnivory, the rest of their anatomy does seem like they could be more than occasional insect eaters and tuber diggers. Hadrosaurs are another category of crested dinosaur that would have benefited from a boost in calcium and protein for growing their crests. Despite the many crested forms of hadrosaurs, their crests were way smaller than those of the ceratopsians and also had a more integrated role in their skull. There is evidence that hadrosaurs occasionally chow down on animal proteins, with a hadrosaur coprolite specimen containing wood and crustacean fragments. There isn't something like it for ceratopsians, so one might take this to mean that it was the hadrosaurs that were more omnivorous than the ceratopsians. That would be biased though, since there is just one specimen of hadrosaur coprolite that preserved this behavior, so it's unknown how frequent that would have been. Ceratopsians, on the other hand, had more anatomical equivalents for occasional omnivory, so only time will tell whether a horned dinosaur coprolite with bones will be found. It seems rather likely that Ceratopsians were more like Mesozoic pig equivalents. They were huge animals with big, imposing skulls, so they could easily push small predators off of their kills. Those shearing jaws and hooked beaks can therefore be looked at as possible adaptations for omnivory, equally capable of processing plants as meat. With the power they had to break apart whole trees, they were capable of breaking apart huge, tough carcasses, perhaps competing with predators and scavengers to access to these carcasses. Those horns and frills would have been all too easily co-opted for intimidation of scavengers. Though they aren't exactly adapted for running down and killing their prey, they were a tremendous force that most predators wouldn't be dumb enough to mess with. A fully grown 13-ton Triceratops had pretty much nothing to fear, as predators like Tyrannosaurus would have gone after the young and the weak. An ambush from one of these dinosaurian tanks would have been quite devastating. The best thing to prove this hypothesis would be a fossil of a Ceratopsian with bones preserved in its gut. Dr. Mark Witten, who inspired this video with his article on the subject, had heard rumors of a Cetacosaurus specimen with bones in its gut, but that has yet to materialize, so I guess it's been lost. So what have we learned? Ceratopsians have the perfect anatomical makeup to be one of the nastiest groups of animals around. A far cry from being peaceful or gentle giants, these things had unusually extreme jaws for bulldozing through just about anything, and the impressive bony protections and weapons to get them there. Only time will tell if this is just speculation, some good reasoning, or something worse. For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, hit the bell icon for updates, like this video, and drop a comment in the comment section below. Thanks for watching. Special thanks goes to my elephant tier patrons, Thea Svensson, Staniforth Hopkins, Dinosaur, Chris Frampton, Biotaverse, Arda Bayer, and Christoph Hubbinger, as well as my Tyrannosaur patrons, Iron Bladesman, Henry Brennan, Danny Van Heck, and Dana Manchester.